All right, what's going on, guys? So today I'm chatting with uh, a good homie of mine, Andrew Coates. Uh, so Andrew, first off, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you having you uh, coming on the show. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of let some of the listeners know who you are? You put this on me. Well, uh, thanks for letting me come on, first of all. Um, I've been a personal trainer for a little over a decade, something I love to do. I still love full-time in-person coaching. I do a little bit of online coaching, something I plan to expand. I do a little bit of mentorship for other coaches, something I started recently based on being asked repeatedly to do it. Uh, I am a fitness writer. I write for T Nation. I've written for True Coach for a while, although I've given them my, my last article for a while. I'm going to focus on other pursuits like my own website. And, uh, and I, ha I have my own podcast for the last three and a half years. I rebranded it when my good friend Dean Guido had to leave. His wife's going to have a baby pretty soon. So um, it's now called the Lift Free and Diet Hard podcast. So a lot of fun, a lot of little extras on top of the coaching career. But, you know, training clients for the last decade has still been the essence of what I've always done. And so I actually met Andrew quite a few years ago, I think at an RP event. It was an RP event, yeah, in Calgary. And, uh, and then I guess we just kind of stayed in touch. And then I, I remember last time I think I saw you in person was at your seminar that you hosted the, the summit back in 2018, 2019, something like that. 2019. So the Evolved Canadian Strength Symposium. So yeah, I also host an MCA conference. Dean Somerset is one of my partners in it. And then Evolve Strength. Uh, we couldn't run it this year, obviously, because the world is completely upside down. So the hope is that if circumstances allows, we can return with it in 2021, but we'll get back to it. Yeah, man. No, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Now that I'm back in Calgary, it makes it real easy just to pop over into Edmonton. So hopefully that, uh, that, that ends up working out. So what I wanted to talk to you today about was getting results when you have a busy schedule. Because I know you've got a lot of clients with pretty diverse background, um, mostly gen pop, and that's a big issue with general population. But then it's also a big issue with other people who are a little bit more serious with their goals as well, because like, I mean, if you really want to be good at powerlifting, strongman or any sport, you got to dedicate a lot of time in the gym. You got to dedicate a lot of time to sleeping, to your nutrition, to just, you know, decompressing and, and you know, making sure you have a pretty or reasonably stress-free life. And so I wanted to talk to you about how you go about actually doing that with your clients. So um, I guess we can just start with like, what are some of the primary issues that you hear from your from your clients who have kind of a, a busier, a little bit more of a jam packed schedule. I, I'll start here because I think this is sort of the essence of it. A lot of the strength of everything is in the strength of the relationship you have with those clients. And you're right. I have you know I work with the, some young athletes, and having a good relationship with with them is is critical. And I have tons of general population people. And while I don't brand or work a lot with, you know, what I would call big fat loss as a, as a demographic, you know, most everybody wants to get a little bit leaner. And I occasionally have a, a bigger weight loss client. And then I have older adults like uh, my client, Larry, he's 70, strong as an ox. He's featured on my social media a lot. He's a lot of fiery legend. The legend. <laughs> he's got this Sandow, you know, if you know your old bodybuilding references, and Santa thing going on at the same time. But what keeps Larry in the gym and most of the other people is loving to come there, enjoying our relationship, wanting to be there. And if a client really loves coming to see you and spending time with you, they're far more likely to come back, which means they're more likely to be consistent. And long-term consistency, regardless of a perfectly scientifically optimized program, tends to lead to pretty good results. If you get someone who does really well with their workout consistency, on average, those people tend to, on their own, make better nutrition choices. So all of these things can be good drivers of progress. As a, alone, as a whole, that tends to do a lot. And then you get into the weeds of the individual person. You mentioned sleep. If you've got a person who is struggling in a lot of areas and their sleep quality is really poor, well, having conversations about Sleep hygiene, right? Are they spending a couple of hours watching YouTube or TV before bed? And then their sleep time uh, opportunity and their sleep quality sucks. They get up and they're tired every morning and they're struggling to get to all their workouts and, and whatnot. And then they're wired at the end of the night for some crazy reason. Uh, are they exposing themselves to too much blue light and screen time? Like that sort of thing. Or is their caffeine timing bad? Or are they consuming a little too much alcohol late in the day? You can get into the weeds of that stuff. If you have a strong relationship with any individual client, 
it's easier to have that conversation. It's easier to talk to them about making nutritional changes to, you know, maybe let go of some of the stuff they're holding on to that they need to. Clients have better results when they're the ones making the choice versus you telling them what to do. And there's certain groups where let's say you've hired a bodybuilding coach who sends you your weekly work, you know, workout weekly meal. Okay, fine. And you're supposed to adhere to it. And I don't love the attitude that, you know, if you don't stick to coaches, they get on their Facebooks and they're like, if you don't stick to your plan, then it's your fault, blah, blah, blah. That's like, that's lazy coach. That's not coaching. That's, that's programming. And, uh, and I, I kind of have a problem with that attitude, but I know that exists in that particular realm. But I still think that the strength of all this stuff is, is the underlying relationship you have with the client. And I'll, I'll let you kind of dig into that a bit more for any clarifying points. No, I, I definitely agree. I find that communication is a really undervalued aspect of coaching. I mean, because realistically, at the end of the day, people aren't necessarily paying for a program. They're not paying for nutrition. They're not paying for a personal trainer. They're paying for results. And, and that results is likely going to adapt over time. And that result is also, you know, there's about a million ways to, to reach that result. And so uh, communication is definitely something that I value. And I actually think that that's probably one of the reasons why my clients get pretty good results versus my own, you know, programming abilities. Um, I, I would imagine there's quite a lot of people out there who are probably better at programming than I am. But I think because of the close, close contact that I have on like a daily basis, we can make those small tweaks and adjustments and adherence is, is like significantly improved. And so how do you go about getting that buy-in initially? Because obviously having that relationship is predicated on, on buy-in, right? Well, I mean, another underrated facet of communication is listening, you know, actually actively listening to what someone else is saying, reading between the lines and stuff versus using the time they're talking to think of what you can say next, which I think a lot of people tend to do. A lot of coaches, when they're in the initial consultation sales experience, probably are doing 60 to 75% of the talking when the actual ratio should be the reverse. So you listen for what works for someone. And I mean, I have a number of clients who are gamers. They work in tech. And I grew up around, you know, playing video games, can't code or program for the life of me, no aptitude there. But there's lots of cool stuff in that world that we can share and talk about. If you've got a client who really loves Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or, or Star Wars, you know, or, or NFL football, then that's part of, you know, that experience to create that report. And then all of a sudden you turn around and you realize, wait, wait a second you know, four sets have gone by, they're actually enjoying it and they're doing well. I guess it really is an individual experience with each client, right? It, it's hard to come up with a set of general rules and how to approach it. But I don't know, I'll, I'll throw it back to you to clarify it a little bit more as well, just because I think it's, it's one thing to just immerse yourself in it and do it. It's an entirely different thing to kind of explain the process. I actually talked about the exact same thing when uh, Mike Desher was was in the podcast a while ago, and actually I've got him on the podcast I think next week as well, which is which is going to be pretty awesome. But we were talking about the same thing and about how when he was initially trying to like explain or educate other people on his approach, he was telling me like how it was mostly intuitive, and he's like, "Man, I know how to do this stuff, but I can't explain it," <laughs> which which is like kind of hilarious that that's a thing, but it it really is. Um, so one of the follow-up questions then, I guess, would be, how do you become better at listening? I know that sounds very stupid, but so many people are just really bad at listening. So it's obviously one of those things that's simple, but not easy. You have to remind yourself to do it. So if I'm working on any particular aspect of my business or me as a, a person, as a professional, I focus on keeping the concepts top of mind. Right now, obviously, you know, we're in Alberta and we're faced with the gym closure. And then there's some gray areas, weird stuff where I have a home gym and I'm able to train out of my basement. Um, we as trainers are allowed to go into clients' homes, right? So that's the explicit language of it, but we're not allowed to be in a, you know, a commercial gym setting working with people. Um, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought there. Um, God, what was the original question? God, all good. Um, yeah, no, I was asking, how do you how do you become better at listening? And you were talking about paying attention and, uh, See, and, and there, there I go, not paying attention. 
So with what I'm doing right now is I'm focused on this why I lost track. I want to make sure that I come out of this whole situation with a strong business. So I'm plugging in very heavily to a lot of books on uh, brand, marketing, sales, I suppose, communication. Uh, for example, I recently just uh, read, again, uh, Jonathan Goodman's Getting Clients and Referrals. Great book. I'm currently going through Michael Port's Book Yourself Solid. Now, I'm someone who, over the course of a 10-year career, has always had you know, as many clients as I wanted through a strong network of referrals. But I want to make sure this stuff is very, very fiercely top of mind. So when it comes to listening, then the literature, the podcasts, the things that you are exposing yourself to, hopefully this is a theme and a topic. So if you want to get better at listening, an element of communication, uh, behavior change, psychology, then plug into books and, and information and follow people who are experts on that topic. So it could be some things like Chip and Dan Heath's uh, book, Switch, which is one good example of many, you know, for, for, for behavior change. And then if this stuff is forefront in your mind, or maybe it's just you writing a note and having it stick it on your mirror in the morning to say practice, practice active listening. Another really good uh, book, I think, for any fitness professional to read or listen to, whichever you prefer, is uh, motivational interviewing, uh, but the one for, I think it's motivational interviewing in nutrition and fitness, right? You can do the regular one because it's a, a broader one, but the one specific to fitness and nutrition, motivational interviewing, quite literally one of the most fundamentally core books on this topic. You could go through a book that's a fairly easy uh, and short read, Crucial Conversations, fantastic stuff, right? And these all have heavy elements about being aware of, you know, actively listening to people instead of that compulsion to be able to turn around and go, well, I'm trying to think of something smart or witty or interesting to say, is we, we often have this egocentric desire to talk about ourselves. So pause during the process of spending time with a client. And if you're thinking of something and it's going to be about you, ask yourself, well, is this really relevant? And can you turn around and ask a question or immerse yourself in something about your client. And sometimes I have clients who really genuinely want to learn about what's going on in my world. Absolutely. And it's okay to have people interested in your success as a career. Lord knows my clients have loved that over the years, but it's really important not to let that be the primary focus of all of your conversations. So it, it does take the reminder to practice it on an ongoing basis within, and not just your client relationships, Practice it in a personal relationship. I bet you any money if that's an issue in, in a romantic relationship, it'd probably go a long way if you did that, or even just with your friends. And it's something that I've actually struggled with at times over the years. So I understand how challenging it can be. And it's never automatic. So it, like any skill you want to develop, you have to keep it top of mind and you have to practice it. 100%. And that's definitely something I've struggled with. And I love the idea that you gave earlier about kind of putting a little sticky note on your mirror or having it in your, you know, agenda of things to do on, on the daily. And then you can just kind of re revisit it every day and say, okay, how did I do, you know, how many instances did I have where I was actually hundred percent present paying attention? And then even taking a step beyond that, what was the impact? Like, how did the conversation go? How, how did that impact the dynamic that we had for either the rest of the training session or the rest of the time that you were hanging out with your friend, partner, whatever, and so, I, yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Um, do, do you focus on autonomy? Do you focus on educating? Do you focus on um, getting them to kind of take more of the workload? Obviously, I would assume that in the beginning, you're going to kind of have to hold their hand and pander a little bit more. But what, what's your process, like just kind of broadly speaking, obviously, to take someone who's, you know, like kind of like Bambi, just can barely even walk on their own and then, you know, take them to this place where, like Larry, He's like fully functioning. He's doing things on his own. He's like super motivated, always showing up, having a great time, just like a really great positive energy in, in the gym. It's, in, in, it's embedded in everything I do with every client. One of my favorite things to tell people very early on and remind them is one of my goals is to make every client functionally independent, right? Now I have clients and you use Larry's example where we, Larry's even talking about maybe setting up a home gym and he would like to get to the point where he does more things on his own. But for the time we've been together, despite my 
urgings to, you know, have him come in on a day on his own. He's been most comfortable training with me exclusively. And that can often be common with older adults, right? You'll see that. So that's fine. I have another gentleman who's also 70. Great to work with, great to listen to. And he has the means to hire me and train with me two to three times a week. And that's to ensure motivation, accountability, consistency, and to keep him safe, right? So some people are just going to do that regardless of how much you want to teach them and educate them. But then there's a lot of other people who just, when you use language like, I'm not trying to keep you forever by showing you an endless array of complex and different things. So you actually have to, you feel like you need your trainer. I want to get people so damned good at the basics that they could function completely on their own, but that they want to stay in our relationship and keep going because they gain some other great value from the experience, be it accountability. The strength of the relationship is often a big one, um, you know, progression, and, you know, being challenged, there, there's an infinite array of elements that's values that someone may find in, in your coaching relationship. There will be clients that will pay for a friend or pay for a therapist. And we've all seen that trainer on a gym floor who isn't really doing a whole lot with their client. I used to have a, a trainer at an old gym who would pretty much sit down the entire time. I, I personally don't think that's a positive reflection on getting floor walk up business. And I, and I don't think it looks very professional. And, and that trainer was often criticized for it. But I mean, that trainer also sold very well and had very, very reliable long-term clientele. So I would always remind people too, you know, there's more going on here. And that client, that trainer's demographic were clients that really were paying for a friend and someone to listen to them and hang out with them. And maybe those people as a self-selecting demographic wouldn't do any exercise otherwise ever, but they're doing at least something in this environment. And maybe it's not up to the standards of people like you and me. We're both big guys. You know, you love powerlifting and strength work and you would see this stuff and scoff at it, but there's a different dynamic going on there. So everybody's going to find different value in the experience, but ultimately, yeah, you try not to overwhelm people with too much information. You see how interested they are in learning it. And then not just showing them what to do, but also showing them the why, right? Teaching them the why, why are we doing this? How are we doing this? And over time, most of those people will probably find it really interesting to learn more about the process. And then I can encourage them, okay, you know, we're training twice this week. Here's your assignment. Here's a workout that I want you to do on your own. Come into the gym on a day that you know I'm here with another client so you know I'm here, you can look over across. If you have a question, you can come over, quickly ask. I'm not going to leave my other client to come and demo something for you, but I've already shown it to you. But knowing that I'm there gives them that sort of safety net, you know, security blanket. And they come in and they gain a little bit of confidence. And maybe they're not ready for that. Okay, cool. We come back around to that idea afterwards as they gain more and more comfort and experience with this. And I work with a lot of people who are total beginners and newbies who know nothing about the gym. But I also work with a lot of people who seek me out to enhance and refine what they're already doing. Uh, to take them a lot further. So those people already have an embedded set of independence. So it's usually pretty easy with them. You're just literally teaching better form, new tools and, and offering some other things like accountability. Maybe they struggle with consistency. Cool. Well, let's build in some of that. So, but it's still just fundamentally a part of everything that I do, the conversations that I have with a client. And, and that extends not just to the training, but also the nutrition as well. And I mentioned earlier, the bodybuilders giving, you know, meal plans, and we can complain about that all we want. If you don't have at least the designation, if it's a, a certification or outright registered dietitian, depending on the jurisdiction, the state, the province you're in, then what you're doing is actually, you know, unethical, if not illegal, and it can set you up to get your ass sued. Okay, but it's not stopping all these bodybuilding coaches who have no education, right, who are giving meal plans, problematic stuff. that We, we see it all the time. It's like three meals a day of of chicken and rice with some broccoli and then a scoop of peanut butter. And that quite literally is stuff I've seen on paper before. And I know it's going out to all of the competitors that, you know, certain coaches have across the board and it's not safe or healthy for these clients, but the clients are doing it to get up on stage. Okay, cool. I get that. Understand. But for the rest of us, you know, I, I'm not interested in even taking the time to build meal plans for someone. I have certifications in nutrition. I am not a registered dietitian, um, but I don't believe that giving people paper meal plans actually helps them at all because it's just giving them something that most of them won't actually do anyway. They won't be consistently adhered to, adhered, adherent to it. So it's a lot of extra work. 
time I don't really have. And what am I going to do? Charge for that extra service? Well, no, because it's not even something I, I want to do. So I would rather have two-way discussions with clients about what they're struggling with, with their nutrition, focusing on small changes that are things that they decide they want to do right at that time. And then as time goes on, we can work on the habits and the behaviors and add up to a better overall picture for their nutrition instead of just throwing it all at them in one shot. Awesome, man. I, I think one of the biggest things that is overlooked uh, that you really drove home in, in what you were just saying was the idea of an iterative approach where it's not, this is what I'm doing. It's okay. Well, where are you at? And then what's the next step that we can take, you know, and, and just whatever that looks like, it doesn't matter. You know, for instance, if you're trying to lift 500 pounds, you wouldn't load a bar with 500 pounds. You'd be like, where are you at and how much can you do? And okay, well, that's where we're going to start from. And a lot of the times, especially with nutrition and training, like I've known a lot of trainers and I mean, I've been guilty of this myself as well. When I first started training, um, I thought you had to train like five days a week and do all this stuff. And like, cause I, I was a boxer, right. For a long time. So I was used to doing six to seven days a week, three hours in the morning, three hours at night, every day, you know? And so I was like, okay, well, if you're only doing five workout sessions for an hour and a half each week, that's not that much. And it's like, meanwhile, I was a kid, I didn't have family, you know? And so I think sometimes that stuff is lost and, and, you know, momentum is a really underrated um, concept in, in fitness, right? Where it's like, you start having success with nutrition, you start having success with, you know, better sleep, you start feeling better and all these things kind of compound, like you're saying, and then it usually just increases buy-in and makes you want to figure out what else you can do to, to get in there. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about what your opinion is, is on this actually, because you know, you generally speaking in the fitness industry, you have these kind of two camps where it's like um, one side is a little more extreme and they're like, you know what, if it's important to you, you're going to find a way. If not, you'll make excuses. And then there's the other side where it's like, man, I'm so overworked. I'm stressed out. Like, yes, I know I need to work out, but it's just so hard to add that because then it adds more stress than it does alleviate it, you know? And like, so it's kind of this weird balance. Now, on the one hand, I will say that if you have kids, if you have a career, that is your choice. You chose that. So I, I don't, I don't believe that, you know, anyone should feel bad for them, but at the same time, I kind of understand where they're coming from, but like, where's your thoughts on that? Where's that kind of line where, where there is a certain level of like rigidity and responsibility, but it kind of has to blend in with reality, I guess. Do you, do you sort of understand where I'm coming from? Absolutely. So, I mean, obviously you're talking about a couple of extremes here. Yeah. Uh, fundamentally, I very strongly believe it's a personal mantra that, you know, you need to control your attitude and your, your efforts, your actions in the face of things beyond your control. Right. So I'm big on personal responsibility, personal accountability, but that doesn't mean everybody else is there. So, you know, someone who yells, you know, things like the, the first example that, Oh, you know, you, you need to work hard. You need to suffer, you know, no excuses, this sort of stuff. Is that really very helpful? Now, I think people like that are fine in the industry because people will self-select to follow and plug into that kind of message. And the people that that helps, great, awesome. They're gonna be motivated by it. Um, so I think complaining about those people also doesn't really do much, right? I think that the other side of, of that where it's like, oh no, it's okay, it's okay, well, you know, there are people in that place and time who that's really all they can handle. And those people will self-select to the, the compassionate message that supports that too. Do I think either message in the long run helps the aggregate population get healthier, fitter, especially the people who are most vulnerable, who are struggling to lose weight, have tried multiple diets, um, tend to listen to the misinformation in mainstream media, or, you know, people like Jillian Michaels came under some fire recently for saying some you know, fundamentally incorrect things about protein intake. And again, I, d I don't think it's worth the time and effort to complain about Jillian. And I think one of the things we should be doing as fitness professionals is do a really goddamn good job of sharing better information and getting your, getting yourself and your ideas in front of a lot more people, grow, reach an audience. I spent a lot of effort this year in, in building Instagram following, worked out pretty well. So I think if you're ultimately interested in helping people, you got to be somewhere in the middle. You got to meet them where they are. And 
maybe the person who has two kids and doesn't sleep enough and wants to be active and struggles with schedule, but they're still trying to come train with you. Well, they're making an effort, right? So they're doing the best they can. So look into their life, meet them where they are, see if there's some low hanging fruit, easy stuff we can help with. If we can identify smaller efforts that wouldn't be overwhelming for them to change, that would yield big results. And maybe that's something within their nutrition. Maybe it's they are catching a lot of food on the run and overeating that way. And something as simple as maybe if they have the resources, a meal prep service, or honestly, that would probably even out in terms of cost anyway, or maybe it would take, you know, sitting down and actually prioritizing, you know, some meal preparation, you know, a couple times a week, make more meals. If the time works for them, it would maybe save them time elsewhere. Okay, cool. Practical strategies and solutions to the problems that they're dealing with. If you've got someone who's much more hardcore and, and the first message resonates with them, okay, cool. And if they're hi they hired you to build a program that they're going to be very adherent to, and they want you to almost yell at them while they're lifting in the gym, okay, cool. You know, take care of them where they are too. But there aren't going to be very many of those people. And those kind of people, especially if they're strength athletes, are going to be seeking out, you know, highly reputable coaches. You get a guy like Mike to share, right? It's funny. You mentioned to share a, a few years back. Um, I would have probably been almost four years ago. I had no idea who he was because I'm not plugged into the strength community, the, the powerlifting world. And there's a seminar going on at Evolve Strength South in, Edmonton, in in Edmonton. And I was working out in Iraq. I was, I think on a weekend and this guy comes out and thick legs, huge lower body. And he starts working out next to me. And I never ever did talk to him, but I saw these signs that he was presenting. And over time, pretty quickly, I realized, wait a second, this guy's actually a really legendary strength coach. And so I was working out in Iraq next to Mike Touchere and never spoke to him, didn't know who he was until after. But uh, I got a little off track there. So I'll let you bring it back around. <laughs> no, for sure. That's, that's crazy. I, uh, I didn't even know that he was in Edmonton. It was almost four years ago. They did a, a, a small seminar uh, in, in Evolve. And every once in a while, they bring in someone like, who, who else is there? Klokov. It had, I've, I've met Klokov. Shook that guy's hand. That, that dude has a strong grip. Holy shit. He's strong hands. Go watch videos of him flipping 25 kilo metal plates in the air and catching them in a pinch. That's some pretty cool stuff. Like, so Klokov's wild, well-built, nice guy. And so, yeah, he's been in there and he's taught seminars in there before too. Um, I'm trying to think of, I, I know there's been a couple other people I've seen. Uh, uh, God, um, I'm pretty sure. Now I was going to say Bryce Lewis, but I actually don't think Bryce Lewis was here. I know Bryce Krawcheck was up here. Yeah. Bryce, a uh, Calgary, uh, young, uh, powerlifting coach. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. I, th I think one of the big things, um, to take away from what you were just saying, uh, prior to, to the whole Mike to shirt thing was, uh, really making a plan and actually having a strategy. I find a lot of the times, you know, especially when you're bombarded with all this information, I remember you made a post a while back about, you know, if your client's asking you about keto, they're probably already doing it or they want to do it. So if you shit on them, it's probably going to deteriorate your relationship a little bit. And so, exactly. um, I mean, like people are bombarded all the time with just so much information. And it's like, even on YouTube, like I was watching a YouTube video earlier and there's that guy V, v, v Shred, I think. And he's talking about how certain foods like broccoli reduce your testosterone. And it's like just absolute nonsense. But that's, you know, you wouldn't know that if you're not involved in the industry, right? And so when you get all this information, you're kind of like, man, what am I going to do? And then you end up just kind of like, having no plan, but a shitload of information in your head and you try like 50 different things to, you know, and invest like 15% of your energy in all these different areas, as opposed to like sitting down and being like, okay, like you were saying, what are the big rocks that I, that I can kind of move right now? You know, Hey, maybe if I get a little bit more sleep, if I get a little bit more sleep, the training session improves, you know, my hunger cravings will probably be down a little bit because I'll actually have a little bit more energy and I won't feel like I need more food to keep me up. And, you know, you can kind of build along those things. So I really like how you kind of talked about that in, in a little bit more depth as well. Just kind of talking about uh, some of the struggles that, that they're going through. So if, if a parent, like if you're coaching a parent who has children and maybe they don't have child minding or, um, you know, they're really, really busy at the office or just whatever else might come up to, to kind of derail their progress. What are some of the things that you look at like just, I, I know that obviously broad recommendations, whatever, but 
you know, in your specific uh, experience with, with some of your clients, can you give some examples of things that you've implemented that have been pretty effective in those cases? One approach with busy, tired people, especially if they have kids, is to get them to buy into this particular notion. Right? If they make a couple of hours a week for exercise, then the time that they've spent doing it tends to pay for itself in the energy and the time, the productivity, the efficiency in every other aspect of your life. Plus, there's a net benefit of their emotional well-being, which if their emotional well-being is better, they tend to find everything else a little easier, right? And then, of course, obviously, they're improving their physical health and their energy. So they've improved their energy level, their productivity, maybe their sleep, which then has a further compounding effect on all this stuff. So it does become the, the buy-in to get them to do maybe a couple of hours of workout a week. And this is an old cliche, low hanging piece of fruit, but you, you ask, okay, you see how much time are they spending scrolling social media? How much time are they watching television? And everyone is entitled to some time, downtime to shut off their mind, especially if life's busy. But maybe within that, you find out that this really busy person also is fairly current on you know, maybe three or four shows that, you know, that are on television. Okay. Within that, chances are there is some room to find uh, find time for exercise. Maybe getting to the gym isn't a thing. Okay, cool. Well, God, I mean, what have we been talking about for the last like ten months? It's home workout training, right? And yeah, sure, getting equipment isn't necessarily the easiest thing right now. But maybe a home based routine that literally is half an hour. You know, kids are just chilling out over there in the corner if they're young, and you get to do that. Right? Again, it's about finding a solution that works for that person. So, but I, but I personally have found with specific clients of mine who have bought into that idea, they've done really, really well. A good friend of mine who tra has, who's trained with me for a few years, uh, we went to university together in Newfoundland, so I've known her for 20 years. Uh, both separately came up to Alberta and along the way, you know, decided, hey, I want to get fit and active and I want to come train with you. And this is exactly what we did is, is to get her to kind of look at this particular relationship between more exercise, more strength training, and how it improved her energy and her ability to, to fit everything else in. She's got two kids, full-time working mom. And nonetheless, she still makes the priority of getting her workouts in. And oftentimes it's early in the morning, you know, before work. Sometimes it's you know, later in the day, whatever it takes. And she's had her ups and downs with it, but she always comes back to it. And she is all she knows that she always feels better when she is working out, like noticeably better. Yeah, it's, it's one of those really funny things because sometimes you feel like exhausted and you're just like, oh my God, the last thing I want to do is go to the gym. But then going to the gym always will make you feel better and always will add to, to giving you more energy and making you feel more emotionally stable and, and just a little bit more resilient psychologically and physically. And so it's kind of funny that it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Like you, you kind of think that it's going to take away, but it actually ends up giving quite a bit more. Um, one thing I actually did want to ask you about was I saw the video you posted today and I absolutely love that on, on Instagram, uh, on your Instagram story, you were talking about looking at your future self and, uh, and asking yourself like, Hey, does this behavior support my future self? Am I doing my future self harm or am I putting them in a good position? You know, can, can you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Yeah, that's a concept I've talked about in various forms of media for a few years. And I think there's something really powerful embedded in. Well, let's start with humans. We're absolutely fucking terrible at making, you know, decisions that support our long-term goals. I mean, how, how long have you been hearing messages about you need to save more money for your retirement? Okay. Uh, we need to eat better, be more active to maintain our long-term health. And yet we need to not smoke because smoking is going to, you know, overwhelmingly likely give us uh, lung cancer or various other problem behaviors, drinking, et cetera, et cetera, gambling. But yet telling people these facts doesn't seem to on the average deter people. So, and I, I think this exercise does often show up in kind of finance for, for saving behavior, but it really applies equally to, you know, physical activity. If you can stop and picture yourself in five years and everyone listening, just, just pause and do this. Like take an image of yourself. Imagine where you probably are in five years. You know, if you're a parent, imagine like you're still caring for your kids five years from now, 
or, or, you know, maybe even look at your parents and think about like longer term future. But the key is humanize yourself instead of an abstract far off concept that you, you feel no attachment with today because we live in the now. So 30 years from now feels like forever. Five years from now feels like forever. It's never going to happen. Well, look at the decisions that you were making five years ago, two years ago, one year ago, and how they contributed to where you are now. Some of them good, maybe some of them bad. Maybe you're struggling to get on track. If you can humanize yourself and see yourself as a distinctive person, you're a lot more likely to be make caring decisions and have empathy for that person. Because, and this is one of the phrases I use, that future self is completely at the mercy of the stuff that you do today and do for the next five years. I am in a position today because I have made, I made some dumb choices along the way, especially in my mid-20s, but I made a lot of choices that maybe they were slow to accumulate over time, but those key decisions led to the career life, the, the physical health that, I, that I'm in, right? I'm 42 years old and you know I feel like I'm in pretty great health for a 42 year old in, in good shape, certainly I think most people would argue. So by humanizing yourself, it is a lot easier to make these decisions. And maybe this is a spark that goes off inside someone's brain and then maybe they decide, okay, maybe I need to make some changes. Cause if you can say, shit, if I continue to do the exact same things that I am doing right now, well, the question was, will you, will you improve? Will you maintain or will you decline? And a lot of people will read that and it makes them uncomfortable. So some people will bypass this because they don't want to immerse themselves in that discomfort. But anyone who did and realized if the exact things that I'm doing consistently would lead my health to decline, I would gain more body fat, I would be weaker, then that can be a very powerful you know, impulse and motivation. And motivation is very fleeting to maybe get started. And sometimes all we need to do is get people started. Because if people get started, they have a far greater likelihood of keeping going. You mentioned momentum earlier, inertia. And then if we're involved in the coaching relationship, then it is very much our responsibility to help facilitate someone from their very earliest desires to change and to make the process something that they're learning, they're enjoying it, and they maintain enough consistency that those habits become established to where they can become more independent. Notice that these are all topics that we talked about this episode, and it gets the ball rolling that all of a sudden they can look back after a period of time. Every client that I've worked with who has stayed the course for a year or more and looked back, their life was changed. They felt not only physically better, night and day physically better, but you can see more youthfulness, more exuberance, more energy, more positivity and, and, and success in, in their working you know, world. Right? This stuff is very powerful and far-reaching effects. Telling them all this stuff doesn't really work, but maybe just getting them to think about themselves in the future as a, as a real person and not as an abstract concept, it might be enough to spark some change today. I think that's one of the big benefits to not only coaching, but, uh, but also having training partners, because a lot of what you're talking about is holding yourself to a higher standard, taking more responsibility for, for the outcomes in your life. And a lot of the times it's what coaches do. That's what trainers, uh, training partners do as well. You know, like for powerlifting anyways, you like when you're lifting really heavy weights and when you're deep into a, an accumulation block, you literally will go into the gym and be scared of the weights. Like, I know I definitely am. Like, I get nauseated. Like, I get that, like, you know, the butterflies in your stomach where you feel like you got to shit your pants, <laughs> you know, like, um, and, and a lot of my friends get the exact same thing. And it's just like, it's just a fact, but you know, your friends are there and you're like, okay, I think that I think I can hit this. And they're like, nah, you got to go up. And we're like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm doing it, you know? And they just like pull more out of you. And I find that, you know, what you're talking about is getting them to, to take more accountability for their situation, getting them to take more accountability for their future and how their actions are directly impacting their future. And that ends up building up the habit of, of doing that just on their own, right? So whether or not they even know it, they'll start looking at things a little bit differently. And then over time, it just kind of becomes an integrated part of their personality. And I think that's a really, really powerful thing that you brought up because I mean, essentially like that, that's what ends up changing people, not motivation. I mean, you mentioned earlier, motivation is fleeting, but the discipline and the habituation 
of, of behaviors is what really makes massive outcomes uh, down the road. One of the things you also mentioned, actually, I thought was really awesome was um, evaluating your progress because I'm sure you've had this happen where, you know, intermittently your clients are like, oh man, like I'm not seeing that much progress, da, 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 da. But then it's like, okay, well, what time scale are we talking about? You know, like this week, this month, because either, you know, like you look back and you're down 30 pounds or your squats up by this much, or, you know, you shaved a full, you know, quarter of a second off your, off your sprint time or whatever it might be. And so, how do you actually evaluate progress with, uh, with your clients? And then how do you make sure that they're viewing it through an accurate lens and there, there's no distortions? Because like, I'm sure you've had clients too who have lost 30 pounds and they still think they're a failure. You know, every, I think everybody deals with body dysmorphia to some degree. And, and there are people that quite, you know, that's, I don't know if that's technically a clinical term where, you know, you deal with people who have anorexia where they really have a truly distorted sense of themselves. But I would look at something like body dysmorphia as a concept, as a, a spectrum of thinking, not as absolutes, you know, pathological clinical bad versus you're hey, a normal person. We all don't truly see ourselves the same way that someone else does. I'll, g- I'll give a specific example and then we can come back around to this. You know, I don't know if, you know, do you have mostly coaches or enthusiasts like strength athletes listening to this? Like kind of who, who are the most? Uh, mostly strength athletes, bodybuilders and coaches. Well, I'll preface this too. You know, some of the stuff I'm talking about is, is about coaching general population people. And if a lot of the listeners here, like if you as a listener kind of put your hand up and you tend to have all these habits and consistency and behaviors of, you know, you all the stuff's really embedded. It's part of who you are. So maybe you, you can't relate to the general population and the struggles that we're, we're talking about coaching them up from literally not having a clue what they're doing. But you know, you're know, Wayne Gretzky and Michael Jordan listening who, who does it very, very automatically. But you look around and Jordan and Gretzky were terrible coaches, owners, you know, leaders in their, when they moved on from being players. So keep an open mind about the struggles that, you know, the society around you, because you see it all the time. So keep an open mind and a bit of empathy for those people, because it isn't like turning on a light switch and maybe go back to the point where you started, where, I don't know, maybe it was always been there, but maybe there were points where it was a bit of a struggle and then it caught hold for you. So with the, you know, the everyday people, you know, let's say you have a woman who has lost 20 pounds, but she doesn't see it. Right. First of all, some people will use the scale, some won't. We have that you know, data. So collecting empirical, like quantitative data can be super valuable. Measurements, things of that nature. But if, if she is prone to kind of, you know, she's telling you that people are telling her she looks great. I haven't seen you in three months. You're looking wonderful. And she tends to deflect it. Well, it, tell her this. You know, honestly, you, you can also say, be careful about commenting on people's bodies. You got to know your client, whatever, like that sort of hyper liberal type stuff. But, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but you can tell this client that if you've got six different people from different walks of life, all telling you the same thing and it conflicts with your own image of yourself, those six people didn't conspire to lie to you and blow smoke up your ass. Instead of, you're not going to change someone's view by telling them this, but at least get them to keep an open mind and accept the possibility that maybe all these other people are telling the truth. And maybe it's your filter that's, clouded and flawed if you can get them to accept the fact that maybe they're not honest with themselves about what they see and that those other people are actually more accurate then you can start to heal that a little bit Um, and then yeah you build in quantitative measures like weight like again it's not the only thing but then if you've got someone who says oh the scale doesn't matter you know how you look how you fit in the clothing you've had someone working out for a year and They've seen some subtle changes in their body. They're stronger. They haven't lost a pound. Guess what? The diet sucks. Okay. It's it, and the goal is, is major weight loss. The diet sucks. You got to make some changes like cut the shit. You have to get into that. And the client has to decide, okay, I have to make some real changes here. And if you're being coach, Oh no, you're doing great. You know, the scale doesn't matter. It's water weight. That's bullshit. Okay. Like let's, let's cut the crap of those, you know, kind of people and, and actually you still got to find a way to make that conversation work with the client. So it's, it's empathetic and you're not, you know, upsetting a client because you don't want to damage your relationship with them. But we also have to be realistic. 
Um, like I said, measurements. Okay, cool. Those can be really useful. But also, you know, you're asking co- questions and having conversations. How do you feel? How's your energy level? Stuff that's a little harder to measure. Um, you know, where's your confidence? How's your, your mood? How's your mental energy? And all this stuff across the board. And if you can have this sort of as a regular focus of your conversation and bring your client's attention to it, it's top of mind. It's in their view and they're more aware of it. You're, you're going to hopefully on a consistent basis, have this forefront enough that a person keeps coming back and keeps working on it. Because if they're consistent, unless they're on a horrible program or they're doing terribly on their diet and they're lying to themselves or just lying to you, they're going to make decent progress if they're consistent with their exercise over a longer period of time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And even just things as simple as you know what, my diet used to be absolute trash and now it's like 50% really good, you know? Progress. Probably not enough to really see some significant results in terms of body composition, but there's a lot of momentum that will lead to a lot of that stuff in the future. And especially with stuff like that, I usually like to relay it to clients and be like, hey, you know, you know when you see a construction of like a really tall building, they spend 90% of the time digging down and building the foundation and then the rest of it just seems to go up in like a month, you know? And, and that's kind of the way that I see nutrition and stuff like that as well. So, but yeah, I say that because um, I had an athlete that I've been working with for probably about a year and a half now, super strong. So she, she won, she won 2019 worlds uh, for powerlifting. And um, I remember there was one time where she came up to me and she's like, man, I'm, I'm so frustrated with my training. And I was like, <laughs> why are you frustrated with your training? She's like, I'm just not getting any better. And I'm like, I'm looking around and I'm like, am I, am I taking stupid pills here? Like, are we serious? And, but she really felt that. And I remember asking her and I was like, Hey, you know that the other day you just lifted your old max that you lifted at worlds, which was a PR. You just did that for a triple or sorry, you did 20 pounds more than that for a triple. You know that, right? And she's like, yeah, but, and I'm like, dude, this is objective evidence. Like if you want to be stronger, this is literally, you know, undeniable proof that you're stronger, but subjective experience is so powerful. And it, what ended up happening, cause I was very skeptical when we had this conversation, I was like, what's going on here? Um, and so I asked her, I was like, have you been talking to people? And she had been talking to people and they were trash talking her. They were just a bunch of fucking haters. They were like, I can't even remember what it was they're saying. They were just like, oh, well, it seems like you're, you haven't really gotten any stronger and blah, blah, like just being a bunch of fucking haters. And I was like, first of all, you don't say that to your friends. Second of all, like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? It's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. But, but that stuff is super common, like where someone will talk to their friend and their friend will say something. And then all of a sudden it's just like, you know, they have this very fragile sense of, of self-esteem or, or appreciation for their, for their accomplishments. And it just all crumbles sometimes anyways, but uh, it's yeah. important to be on guard against sabotage, yeah. saboteurs, resentful people in the world. And, and some of you have to yeah. those people and either put them in a box or in some merciless cases, actually cut them out. They exist in all walks. You know, with, when it comes to high level athletes, if someone's not supportive or, or doing this kind of crap, that's actually fairly destructive. Or maybe it's the office worker who is overweight and damn well knows that you know, she needs to start being active and feels insecure in a lot of ways and then sees that you are eating better and you're working out and you've been consistent and you're making some progress. And you're making that person very uncomfortable and very aware of the things that they don't like about themselves. Now, people are terrible at taking personal ownership and recognizing, wait a second, my decisions, my behavior is causing this. They tend to look at the person who makes them feel that way and go, that's the villain. And whether it's conscious or subconscious, they'll do things to deter or sabotage it. And, uh, and that means donuts and other sort of things in the workplace and language like, oh, you know, just live a little, oh, just have one, right? And that's a very deliberate attempt to make the stimulus that's making them feel bad about themselves go away. And I think, I hope everyone listening kind of, kind of is like, oh yeah, I see that shit happening all the time. So be on guard against that stuff and be on guard against people in your, your mental space who aren't 
not supporting, not, not being helpful, like the example that you just used. Yeah, that sort of behavior is super undermining and like it, it really is destructive, especially if you, you have someone like that in your home, right? Like if you, you know, are trying to get uh, serious with your fitness goals, but then your partner's not necessarily invested. I've seen a lot of instances, of, I'm positive that you have as well, where their partners will actually, you know, criticize them and be like, oh, you're changing. You're just all about this. And it's like, when in reality, like you should probably be supportive of what your partner is wanting to do because this is a very important goal for them. And obviously it's kind of a weird, you know, conversation to navigate, but it's, it's one that needs to be had a lot of the times. Oh, I have dealt with lots of this stuff. And I think anybody who's ever coached anyone has seen this. I mean, there's a story, I think it was out of India where some guy didn't, it was like, he was really controlling with his wife and he was putting steroids in her food without her knowledge. And she was growing like facial hair and like other sort of things were happening. I mean, it got exposed and she eventually left him. I mean, that's an extreme example. I mean, you know, that's so that's like, I don't know. You can Google that. That was pretty funny. It's not funny. That's terrible, but it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> you got to be able to chuckle at stuff. And then, I mean, I've had, I mean, I had one old client, great, great guy, loved working with him. And, you know, no one, no one would know who this is, but had a then girlfriend later became a wife who in my interactions with the gym, I'm sorry, was a miserable person, was a negative and unpleasant individual. So along the way, I noticed that whenever he would book sessions, she would make sure that he had something that he had to do in terms of an errand or a responsibility, fairly short notice. So he's starting to miss a lot of sessions. And then after a little while, she turned around and tried to say, well, now, you know, book the sessions through me. You know, she was trying to control the process and I was having none of that. And there was some other stuff that went on in the relationship that was particularly problem behavior in terms of one person being controlling, very insecure about the partner getting in shape, um, you know, due to their own insecurities. And unfortunately, it did lead to a tough conversation that ultimately led to, I mean, I still get along with that client to this day, but I haven't trained him in years. And as a coach, you also have to recognize these situations and go, well, if you got someone who's canceling all the time and you have your cancel policy, sure, but it's frustrating. It causes stress and you are better off as a coach to not fire clients. I hate it when coaches brag about firing clients. I think that's just shitty behavior, but let people go who are draining your emotional energy that you dread dealing with these situations who it's, it's always a fight to get them to schedule. They cancel a lot on you who are always late paying. The moment you get comfortable with letting these people go, the better your mental energy is, the better that that energy is for the other clients. And you'll just find that with that better energy out into the universe, you will attract and, and bring on more clients. And this is a tough lesson to learn over the years, but when I've practiced it, it's worked out really, really well. This is one of the premises of, a, of the book I mentioned earlier, um, Book Yourself Solid by Michael Port. And I think any coach who really does want to get busier, grab a physical copy. Don't audio this one. Do the physical copy, get a notebook, do the exercises in it. Take it seriously. It gets into figuring out your target market. What are the type of qualities and, and personality behaviors of people that you, your existing clients that you love working with? So anyway, it's, it's a useful tool if someone decides to, to go down that road. Yeah, so we're coming up on that hour mark, and I definitely want to be respectful of your time. Um, but where, where can the listeners find you? All roads go through Instagram. So that's the easiest thing of all. So at Andrew Coates Fitness, C-O-A-T-E-S. And then I'm always linking my podcast to it. Again, the podcast is called the Lift Free and Diet Hard Podcast. But we're here on your podcast, so I'd rather people turn around and I mean, if, they, if the stuff I'm saying like massively resonates, cool, love to have you. But you know, go give Daniel a review if you haven't. I mean, if, you, if you've been listening to him for a while and you haven't, geez, that takes under two minutes. If you're driving, wait until you get where you're going. But seriously, take those two minutes. Like that, you're not paying anything to listen to stuff. You got a lot out of it. It helps me out a lot. So go do that sort of stuff. And then um, you know, anything like if I have a TV guys, show, don't be greedy. Said I second that, guys. Don't be greedy. Give me a follow, and give me a like, give me a positive review. <laughs> I try to get T Nation an article once a month. I'm so busy that, uh, you know, I'm like my buddy Gareth Sapson, I swear to God, he's got three a week up there. 
But uh, I try to get them like one or two a month where I can. So that way, you know, I'm doing something for them. I always try to make sure it's really good stuff. So, but I always link that on my social media anyway. And I do plan on being a bit more active on Facebook. You know, I'll accept friend requests of people who I kind of know or they're in the industry. But um, it's something I got away from. And honestly, it's probably a good idea to get back to it a little bit. But all roads lead, uh, go through Instagram. Awesome. So I'm going to have all that stuff linked up in the show notes, guys. Definitely check them out. Andrew posts a ton of great stuff on his uh, on his Instagram, on the regular. He writes a lot of awesome uh, articles for T-Nation, a lot about like everything from like fat loss to bodybuilding to injury to a whole, a whole host of different things. His podcast is dope. He's had a lot of great um, uh, guests on his podcast as well. Um, same, actually, we, we've had a lot of the same guests on, on both of our podcasts, actually. That's um, amazing. Yeah, so definitely give him a follow. And... Uh, yeah, make sure you share this episode. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you do all that stuff so I can grow this and become a world superpower. <laughs>